Well, this certainly is an age of progress, isn't it? There's been more of scientific discovery, more of technical advancement and material progress in your lifetime and mine than in all the ages of history. Invention has become the symbol of the age. And the mousetrap could well be the symbol of invention. What father hasn't said to his offspring, son? Build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a pathway to your door. And the sons have been busy doing just that, thinking, planning, working, and they've built their better mousetraps. For man has discovered a lot of things. And yet, perhaps the most embarrassing discovery is the fact that regardless of what man may invent or devise, nature had it first. Traps? Why, there are literally millions of them. Far more wonderful and complex than anything man has ever thought of. The similarity between a Venus flytrap and a bear trap is quite remarkable, isn't it? The teeth, the action. Now, the bear trap has a trigger right uh, there. And if that trigger is pushed... <coughs> now, the Venus flytrap has a trigger also. In fact, it has six of them. Three on each side. But there's a difference. The bear trap doesn't know a bear from a piece of wood, but the Venus flytrap does. You see, to touch the trigger hair just once is not enough. Nothing happens. But if we touch the trigger hairs more than once, and at just the right intervals, the trap is sprung. You see, no energy is wasted on a twig or a leaf that might fall into the trap. But even more amazing is how those trigger hairs work. There is actually a flow of electrical current from those tiny trigger hairs to the apex of the plant. And when anything touches them, the flow of current is interrupted. A correct number of these negative impulses will cause the trap to spring. Why, the trap is also a stomach. The animal will soon be digested by the plant. And in a few days, the Venus flytrap will be open for business again. Some of the traps are passive. The cobra plant, for example, is a type of pitfall. Inert, but effective. The hood of the plant is a maze of tiny windows. These appear to the trapped insect to be a way of escape. In a frustrated attempt for freedom, a false step usually occurs and the insect adds to the daily vitamin requirements of a carnivorous plant. Most of the pitfalls simply allow the prey to follow the line of least resistance. Getting out, however, is an entirely different matter. The tiny hairs on the welcome mat suddenly become spears that surround a prison. When an insect topples in, a pool of death awaits below. The liquid will put him to sleep and then digest him. Talk about your traps. This is a working model of one of the most fantastic traps ever built. Now the prey approaches, triggers the mechanism. This trap even resets itself. Now. Can you imagine building all of this complicated mechanism into a trap the size of the head of this pin? God did it. The plant itself, the utricularia, lives beneath the surface of the water. Each of the small globular objects is a trap, much more complicated than our working model. The trap itself is so tiny that it will take a microscope to see it work. But if we're fortunate, we can actually see the plant trap tiny animals. Notice the guide hairs and the three small trigger hairs. When the trigger hairs are bent, the 
the trap is sprung. And when an animal gets sucked inside, eventually he succumbs and is digested. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, man can't even claim the symbol of his own inventions. Each new discovery reveals the more how thoroughly God has gone before. That door, for example. Somebody had to think of it. Each day, we see doors of every kind, of every size and shape. But actually, none of these is quite as remarkable as a door fashioned long before man ever dreamed of the device. Of course, this door isn't easy to see. The camouflage affords real protection to the trapdoor spider. Snugly fitted into the ground, the door is lined with layer upon layer of silk, a marvel of engineering. And no less a marvel is the spider herself. For if, in spite of her camouflage, her privacy is disturbed, she hangs onto the door with all her might. In order to break her hold, a pull of at least 140 times her weight is needed. The trapdoor spider is a skillful engineer that has never seen a drawing board or a transit. When the need for building a home arises, excavation proceedings get underway. The spider is well equipped for the job at hand. Both ends work at once. On the uh, south end of a northbound trapdoor spider is a pair of spinnerets. On the north end, a pair of strong pedipalps function like a steam shovel, digging the dirt and placing it precisely where it should be. The god that made this wonderful little builder provided her with all the necessary tools. When she encounters excessive dirt, the steam shovel becomes a catapult. The finishing work on the trapdoor is the surfacing of the underside with a fine silken lining. When the job is completed, there will be a lustrous coating of silk from the top of the nest to the bottom. And the coating will be as smooth as glass and as soft as down. What could be more fitting after a hard day's work than a good square meal? Expert calf roping requires the all-out effort of both horse and rider. And yet for countless centuries, the chameleon has been lassoing its food with just a flick of the tongue. It took man a long time to think of some of the other ideas we find to be a part of the chameleon. The eyes, for example, are mounted in ball turrets, and one side organ is able to rotate independently of the other. While one eye is watching for an enemy, the other is searching for a bite to eat. When the tasty prey is sighted, the eyes work in unison, probably to improve the aim of the tongue. <laughs> The skin of the chameleon is a heavy plate of armor, and it's not only tough, it's made up of an amazing cell structure that enables the chameleon to change color on a moment's notice. Camouflage is as old as life itself. These baby chameleons are just a few hours old, and already they're on their own, making immediate use of all that God has given them. From the tiny ball turret eyes to the feet, the tongue, and the tail. Imagine something like this happening to you when you were just a few hours old. To the baby chameleon, it's all a part of this wonderful new life. No formulas or bottles are necessary. When the tiny reptile feels the need for sustenance, he simply helps himself. 
A grasshopper is a giant compared to the baby chameleon, but the little fellows show no fear. Perhaps they realize that someday a grasshopper will be nothing more than a bite to eat. Do you know what this is? It's a bolus. For years, it was used as a type of lariat by the Argentine gaucho. But long before the days of the gaucho, a certain fat, grotesque little spider was making good use of the bolus. Chances are you've never seen her. For like a great many spiders, she's active only at night. The spider forms her bolus by rolling up a little ball of sticky silk which she hangs from the end of a strong silken line. Then she pulls herself up to a vantage point, catches hold of the bolus, and prepares to cast it at the first insect that comes within range. Since the spider is ready and waiting, let's dangle a tasty morsel in front of her and see what happens. A flurry of activity always follows a catch. But the moth really doesn't stand a chance. The spider makes use of a pair of built-in hypodermic needles to put her victim to sleep. She injects just enough venom to paralyze her prey, but not enough to kill it. That way, the food remains fresh. We've seen plants that eat animals, animals that lasso food with their tongues, but just as amazing, if not more so, is the fish that spits. You know, the archerfish can actually shoot insects out of the air. Now think of the problems he has. In order to hit the moving target, he must know its elevation, its direction of travel, the speed of the insect, the speed of the projectile, all of this so he can lead it just enough to hit it. For a fish to make all the split-second computations necessary to hit the target would seem utterly fantastic, wouldn't it? But the archer fish does it time and time again. For a long time, man's excursions underwater were limited by how long he could hold his breath. Various devices have extended that limit from a few minutes to several hours. A diving suit with a complex system of air and communication lines, lead shoes and descending line, provide him with a cumbersome but reasonably efficient means of remaining submerged. Another underwater breathing device, consisting of compressed air bottles, special demand regulators, face mask, and breathing tube, allows for much greater freedom of movement. As a result, thousands of the more adventurous have taken up this exciting sport to add another dimension to their lives. But wait a minute. What about this little creature? The Argeronita, or diving spider. No elaborate equipment here, just a bubble of air. No heavy cable or descending line, just a thin strand of silk. The home of the Argeronita is unique. A silvery bell filled with air and attached to the stem of a submerged plant. No heavy door bars entrance to this silvery bungalow. She has but to touch the wall, and she's in. The problem is to get out without dividing the house into a duplex, and stay out without drowning. This is accomplished in a most ingenious fashion. The spider breathes through openings in its abdomen. In order to survive, it must always retain a life-giving bubble of air to cover its breathing apparatus. Yes, 
us, at last man has solved the problems of limited ventures beneath the tide. Apparently accepted by this strange family of creatures that move so gracefully through a fluid sky. But we cannot help but pause and wonder at the engineering skill imparted to this little spider that enables it to live a lifetime underwater. Looks like something out of the future, doesn't it? Actually, it's a very real development of today. A special type of binocular viewer that enables the wearer to see in the dark. Once the eyepieces are adjusted, visible light is no longer needed. Instead, we can use an infrared lamp, a source of invisible or black light. As the infrared rays travel through the maze of optical and electronic equipment, they are changed into visible light. But uh, was man first? Rattlesnakes have been able to see infrared rays for thousands of years. In a sense, they have two sets of eyes. And the organ that sees in the dark is in a pit or depression on either side of the head. Dr. Raymond C. Coles and Dr. Theodore H. Bullock of the University of California at Los Angeles have contributed much to the world's new knowledge of this strange phenomenon. For many years, man has known that the pit viper could, in some strange, mysterious manner, find his prey in the dark. But how? Well, let's find out. Dr. Coles milks the rattler of its venom. Dr. Bullock anesthetizes the reptile. The snake is blindfolded, depriving him of sight in the realm of visible light. Platinum electrodes are connected to the nerves coming from the pit organ so that the tiny signals flashed from the organ to the snake's brain can be intercepted. These signals are amplified so that they may be heard on a loudspeaker or recorded on a graph recorder. And now for the test. The snake is obviously excited by the human hand. A warm-blooded animal has crossed its path. The snake can see the invisible infrared rays from the heat of a human hand. An ice cube is of little interest to the rattler. Why? Well, an animal that cold would be dead. Lighting a match in front of the snake is like turning on a searchlight of infrared rays. The recorder shows a sudden, violent reaction. A piece of special heat-absorbing glass cuts off the rays, and the snake's reaction stops. Well, it took man a long time to find out how to build a device that would enable him to see in the dark. And yet the rattlesnake has been using his own for countless ages. Once again, nature had it first. Since earliest times, man has wanted to fly, to imitate the birds. Finally, after centuries of fruitless effort, man has been able to do just that. But once again, only because nature had it first. And speaking of birds, nowhere in the world do we find a more interesting variety than on the islands of Midway. such as the fairy tern with its plaintive cry and its delicate beauty. The nest of the fairy tern is most unusual. One egg precariously balanced on a swaying limb. It's rumored that the baby bird is born feet first through the bottom of the egg, but once it gets a good foothold, falling off is simply out of the question. The fairy terns are quiet, quaint, and friendly. Not at all like the sooty terns who take to the air and scream displeasure at the slightest disturbance. The 
real attraction of the islands of Midway is the beautiful Laysan albatross. In the air, these birds are a beautiful sight to see as they gracefully soar on tireless wings. When the albatross comes in to land, a good part of his elegance is folded up with his wings. On the ground, he's just a goony bird. He has a hayfoot, strawfoot kind of a walk that quickly appeals to the sense of humor. The goonie just wasn't built for shore duty. At the ends of his scrawny legs are big webbed feet. Feet that are fine for swimming, but oh, so hard to walk on. The goonie bird's nest is one egg on the sand. And the parent bird will never sit on the nest without first talking to the egg. Junior is a ragged bundle of downy fur and quite a responsibility. Many hours of fishing at sea are required for the adult bird to bring home a satisfying meal. The dance of the goony bird is an exhibition never to be forgotten. It seems to be just a game as it continues beyond the mating season. The invitation to the dance is a series of graceful bows. When a partner is found, the elaborate routine gets underway. The name Goony means literally a simpleton, and the dance of the bird is in perfect keeping with his reputation. The black goonies have an even more vigorous dance and they're very fussy about the routine being just so. When a goonie takes to the air, it's quite a struggle to lift its heavy body off the ground, but soon the wings stretch out and they span over seven feet as the albatross soars majestically into space. Man's curiosity is an interesting thing. Thirst for knowledge compels him to seek out the unusual. It takes him to strange and desolate places like Guadalupe Island, almost 200 miles off the west coast of Mexico. What is it this time that man is after? What strange thing has attracted his interest? Well, of all things, a sea elephant. Just a few years ago, this strange creature was thought to be extinct. The animals once were a valuable source of oil and man had slaughtered them by the thousands. The weight of a big bull elephant is a preponderous 5,000 pounds. He'll measure somewhere around 16 feet and his nose is really an oddity. It's almost two feet long. Somehow, a few of the animals managed to survive. And today, they're slowly growing in numbers. The elephant seal is plagued with a strangely familiar ailment. This ailment has been known to affect man. Papa isn't the only victim, either. Mama has a touch of it, too. And the baby just wouldn't think of being different. You'd never guess it. The elephant seal just doesn't look the type. But he has another ailment common to man. Believe it or not, he has stomach ulcers. Even in the ridiculous case of the stomach ulcer, the very badge of modern inventive man, nature had it first. If a competent psychiatrist were to examine the human race as a whole, he could not escape the conclusion in view of the condition of the world that man is mentally, morally, and spiritually ill. 
In probing for the cause of that illness, he might discover it in the fact that man is failing to recognize the prior claim. Now let's think about that claim for just a minute. In order to think, you must use your brain. But uh, where did we get the brain? It's a marvelous piece of equipment. Is it something that man has developed gradually through increasing use? Those who study the human mind tell us that no man, not even the smartest, has ever used more than two-tenths of one percent of his full mental capacity. Obviously, man didn't develop his brain through use. The logical conclusion is that man was given his brain by the one who created him. God has an undeniable claim upon your life by the right of creation. But do you know that he has an even stronger claim? It's the right of purchase. God says, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. God bought us not to enslave us, but to free us from our slavery to sin. And the purchase price? The life of his own son, freely given, that we might live. For God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, God has a claim upon our life because he made us and because he redeemed us. He has a claim upon our obedience. God has never asked us to do anything that is wrong, nor to refrain from doing anything that is right. He has a claim upon our confidence. No man can say, I trusted God and he failed me. Yes, and he has a claim upon our love. For we love him because he first loved us and gave himself for us. This, then, is the prior claim. Have you recognized this claim in your life?